Hello, I'm Dr. Andrew Kaczynski of Advanced Concepts in Plastic Surgery, and this is another in our series of tutorials for plastic surgery one on one. Today we'll be talking about breast augmentation. So, the first thing we want to talk about is indications. Why do people have breast augmentation? In my practice, the patients are basically divided into two parts. Uh, one group of patients are young women who have just never been blessed. They never developed beyond an A cup and will never develop beyond an A cup. So there's a lack of breast development. The second group is a group of women, usually in their late 20s, 30s, sometimes even 40s and 50s, who've had children and the problem with breastfeeding is that each child that you breastfeed consumes breast tissue. This breast tissue is used up and once it's gone, it's gone forever. Breast augmentation restores that volume. So in the first group, you're putting in volume that was never there. In the second group, you're restoring volume. Breast augmentation is about putting volume back into a breast. If there are other issues, things like sagging or different shapes, then more surgery is needed. Things like breast lifts and other adjustments, which we'll talk about at a later date. So the next thing that you need to know about are the implants. What are the choices in implants? There are basically two choices, silicone and saline. Silicone has been around for many years. It was taken off the market because of lawsuits and other issues that the FDA had with it. The FDA approved the silicone implants within the last several years and they're back on the market better than ever. The advantages of silicone are it is softer, it tends to move better, and has a natural feel. There's less chance of rippling or wrinkling. It's a little more expensive. The other alternative is a saline implant, which is basically a silicone shell or a balloon that's filled with sterile salt water. For some people, these implants work extremely well. They're a little bit firmer. They have more chances of wrinkling or rippling. They're less expensive. In general, if people have good tissue coverage, which means they have enough skin and muscle to cover the implant, saline implants work very well, as do silicone. If people are very thin, I recommend silicone almost exclusively because there's more chance of the implant being visible and having that round ball on a wall look, which nobody wants. The next thing to talk about is incisions. There are several different incisions that can be used. The original incision was what we call the inframammary or at the, at the breast fold. Uh, this is very popular in some parts of the country. In California, very few people use this incision. It is more visible under a bathing suit when someone lifts their arms up. If the scar turns out to be a less than good scar, it's almost impossible to revise it. The next incision is what we call the periareolar, which is at the border of the nipple, at the intersection of the pink or brown tissue and the whiter skin. This incision generally heals very well to a hairline scar and it allows access to the entire breast area. Another incision that is used in some patients, especially with saline implants, 
is the axillary. I've done hundreds and hundreds of these and in the right person it's an excellent incision. However, it does not suit itself towards particularly large implants. And if there's a little bit of adjustment that needs to be done in the fold, it's not a very good incision. Lastly, the belly button incision achieved some popularity, although very few people did it. It allows implants to be put in from a distance, but it only works with saline implants and it's basically a blind type of incision. So every one of those incisions is a good incision for the right person. In general, I use the Perry Reeler because it's an all-purpose incision that heals extremely well. So the next thing to talk about is placement. Do you put the implant under the muscle or over the muscle? And what that means is there's a chest muscle called the pectoral muscle and the implant can be put either under it or over it. Why would you do one or the other? The over the muscle was the original operation done many years ago. It still works well for some people. The problem with this is that the implant is much more visible and there seems to be a higher rate of capsular contracture or internal scarring. Placing it under the muscle is actually a more difficult surgery but it also brings more rewards. Having it under the muscle covers the upper pole of the implant so it doesn't look as round or as artificial. There's also less chance of seeing folds wrinkles and ripples in the implants. Nowadays, I would say 99% of my implants are placed submuscular. Most plastic surgeons favor the submuscular approach. Now, when you're putting in the muscle, there are several ways of doing that as well. The chest muscle extends from your arm and goes to the middle of your breastbone, something like that. So the implant is, is put under here through a little incision. There's a little incision made in the muscle and there's a space in there that is easily opened up and the implant goes in. Um, some people put the implant just under the pectoral muscle and then it's more or less free floating down here. Other people, myself included, <coughs> use another muscle off to the side here which is called the serratus muscle and this muscle gives more support to the implant. It acts like a living bra. And by doing that, it prevents rippling and wrinkling in this area, which is otherwise the thinnest part of the breast. So even though it doesn't r remove the chance of wrinkling or rippling 100%, by having an extra half inch or so of padding, it improves the results. So this is my preferred implant placement. Under the muscle, but basically under several muscles to give a better result. One other thing we should talk about is longevity. How long do implants last? There's sort of an urban legend that many patients tell me about that 